you matter to God. There are many ways to get involved at Fellowship. So start by filling out a Connect card. And bring it out to the Connecting Center. We would love to meet you and give you a gift as our guest today. We also love praying for each other. So if you have a prayer request, drop a prayer card in the offering basket. You can also come pray with one of our prayer partners after the service. We'd love to pray with you today. Again, we're so excited to have you here this morning. Now, let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Let's worship together this morning. We are so excited that you've joined us. Let's turn our hearts to Him, to His grace. Grace that flows like a river, washing over me. Out of heaven, ever Christ, overflowing me. Thank you, Jesus.
Again, Fellowship Dallas, we are so glad that you have joined us to worship together. It is a pleasure to be together. Let's take a second and greet the people around us. Let's tell them we're glad to worship with them this morning.
song says, our praise will ever be on our lips. We're praising a great God, a God that does it once, that does it twice, and he does it over and over again. The next song that we sing states that, talks about how God does it over and over again. And sometimes in our lives, we can get complacent. We can get to a point where we feel like we're on a plateau. And I know that I've been praying myself myself and my family, that God would just make me uncomfortable. Make us uncomfortable, God. Shake us up. And in the midst of that being shaken, there's going to be some times where we don't understand what's happening, and what's going on, but we do know that if we can just rest on the fact that God did it once before, we know that he'll do it again. And so I'm prayerful that we can be here today and know that God has done it once and he'll do it again. Just say
His mercy.
You may be seated. Amen. Good morning. I'm Christy McElhenney. I'm the children's and parenting pastor here at Fellowship. We are so glad that you're here today. Um, we just hope that you've had a great year so far. Our first month is almost over. Hard to believe, isn't it? Um, but we are so glad you're here. And if it's your first time, welcome. We, um, we are so happy to have you, and we would love to get to know you. Um, on the seats in front of you, there are some cards that are connect cards. We would love for you to fill that out. And you can either put it in the offering plate, or if you take it out to our Connect Center after the service, we have a gift for you for being here with us today. And on the back side of that card is our prayer cards. Um, we are a church and a staff that believes firmly in the power of prayer. We meet as a staff every week to pray for every one of these cards and your needs. Um, so we just ask you to write that down for us because we would love to be praying for you and see what God can do because he does amazing things as we've just been singing about. Um, if you're new, we also have an opportunity for you to get to know a little bit about our church. I know it's a big church and it can be hard to know where do I, what do I do next? How do I get involved? We have a class called Discover. Um, it will meet on February 2nd during the second service. We would love to have you join us for that. Get to know a little bit about what goes on here at Fellowship and get to know a few people um, and get you connected in that way. That would be great. Um, another class, actually a whole bunch of other classes that we have coming up, are our training experiences. Our training experiences are opportunities with different topics, different things that allow you to take a step into moving closer and stronger in your relationship with the Lord. Um, we have Repurposed, which is an opportunity to get to know your God-given purpose, a great class to take. Um, our Spiritual Disciplines is a way for you to understand how to just engage deeper in your relationship with Jesus through healthy habits. Um, steps is an opportunity for you to figure out how to kind of put aside the things that have been holding you back in your relationship with the Lord um, and getting rid of those things. And uh, we have a grief group that will help with getting past some grief or begin the process of dealing with grief. Um, we have threaded, which is an opportunity to just learn what does the Bible say about race and racial reconciliation. Um, so we're excited about that one as well. A couple of my personal favorites um, I get to lead this semester. Um, one of them is Mom Life. It's our every other week Tuesday morning opportunity for moms of kids of any ages to get together. We, uh, we eat food, which is always good. And uh, we're going to be studying the super moms of scripture this semester, and we're just going to do life together and encourage each other as moms. And then our parenting through the phases um, is our class that's going to be meeting on Tuesday nights. Uh, we have three children. They're all grown, and every one of them was completely different. Um, I thought I had it down with the first one, and then God said, let me show you what you don't know with the second one. And so um, there's so many differences in kids, but there are very similar core needs that our kids have in every developmental phase of their lives. And parenting through the phases is an opportunity for us to talk about what are those core needs and how do we access those and reach those in our kids to help them become more like Jesus all the way from birth through high school. So it's for parents with kids of all ages. So we hope that you'll join us for some of those classes and we know that you'll be blessed by that. Um, and speaking of blessing, our Lord blesses us greatly in all that we do and, and in our church and through you guys. We just love being here and we want to give back. And so this is an opportunity for us to do that as we take our offering. It's an act of worship that we can do um, just to show the Lord how much, how grateful we are for what he does. So would you bow with me as we pray for our offering? Father, you are the giver of good things. You are sovereign and mighty and faithful as we've been singing about this morning. And every day, you don't let us down. Um, even in the midst of trials and hard things and confusing times and uncertainty, we know that you are faithful and that you will never, ever change. So we just pray, Father, that as we, um, in an act of worship, give back to you, we pray that you bless it. We pray that you will... Um, just continue to help us to feast our eyes on you and see the goodness that you give to us as we give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been in this series on love. Uh, this is our second week. 
in it. And last week, Kurt taught on the passage where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. As he was teaching that and as I was preparing for this week, it just kind of, that passage really struck me. And I thought about it in the context of another passage of scripture where this woman comes before Jesus. She sits at his feet and she washes his feet with her hair and her tears. And what struck me is that that's the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God who is worthy for us to come before him and wash his feet with our tears. But he's the kind of God who came down to earth, who humbled himself, that he would wash our feet. That's who we're worshiping, church. So as we consider love, as we consider the way that he loves us, as we consider the way that we love him, the way that we worship him, I wanna just give us a moment as a church just to consider what agendas we're bringing to the table when we worship. What are you hoping to gain from this worship experience? Why did you come to church this morning? As we consider those things, I just encourage you to lay those at the feet of Jesus, whatever they are, and just trade them for him. Just trade them for who he is because he is more than enough. He's more than worthy. Let's continue to worship him. Let's continue to praise him this morning. Nothing else, 
Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. No, I just want you. And nothing else. that to him we give him our heart I'm caught up in your presence and I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave never want to leave all I want is you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, Jesus you are all we want. You are the reason that we've gathered. You are the reason that we are here, Jesus. Just you. Just you. Just your praise. Just your glory. Your name to be lifted high. God, stir in our hearts to lay down the agendas that we have before you. To lay them at your feet. God, the desire just to check a box to be here. God, we give it to you. God, the desire for some kind of a feeling, we give it to you. The desire for some sort of blessing, that requirement from us, God, we don't have that. You don't owe us anything. We want you. We want your kingdom. We want your will. We want your place, your seat, your throne here on earth. Change us, mold us, and shape us to be a people let Fellowship Dallas be a people that love you. 
and that want you. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for this moment, Jesus. We give it back to you. God, we pray this in your beautiful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Over halfway through January. I can't believe it. Happy uh, Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. Um, I, uh, in preparation for today, I was reading some of the things that he said, and I found a quote that I, I think just fits perfectly with what it is that we're, we've been talking about over the last couple weeks and we're going to continue to talk about over the next few weeks. It's from his letters from a Birmingham jail. This is what he says. <clears throat> He says, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I think what he's saying there is that, that, that we are a part of each other's lives, and the way that we live our lives, the things that we do, impacts everyone else. And even though he's talking about all of humanity, I believe what he said is also true of followers of Jesus. Over the last few weeks, we've seen that Scripture tells us that you and I belong to one another. We're part of each other's lives. That we've been woven together by the Holy Spirit into a single garment called the body of Christ, the church. And, and the way we live with one another matters because it impacts everybody. And God knowing that, God making us belong to one another has given us commands, given us some counsel on how we're to do that through these commands called the one another's. They're really the playbook for how we're to live with one another, the the substance of our belonging, the substance of our mutuality. And that's what we've been looking at throughout this series and will continue to do so. If you were here last week, you know, we started the series uh, with Jesus' command to love one another. And I was the beneficiary of love this week. There was a group of people who loved me. Based on one of the stories that I told you last week, our staff got together and they sent me a note that says, hey, just want you to know that your gang is behind you. And it was accompanied by this photograph. (laughs) Wouldn't you not feel loved right there? This is what happens when you have a bunch of off-site meetings on a Thursday. They go to your office and they take photographs. And this morning I walked in and guess what is decorating my office now? About 30 teal bandanas. It's a thrilling look. I'm just so glad to see that we can still get teal bandanas and, 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 and apparently in bulk too. So uh, it was so moving, so touching. I love our staff. They were so good to me and I felt loved uh, because of that. So So last week when we uh, looked at this command to love one another, I gave you a definition. It's kind of long, but I think it unpacks what Jesus means when he says love. I defined it as this. I said, excuse me, love is an unconditional, self-giving, others-benefiting expression of my goodwill and affection. That's pretty lofty. That's pretty heavy. So we might ask the question, okay, well, how does that happen And what does that look like when we actually go to love someone like that? Can we just wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I think I'm going to love one another today, and we're going to know exactly how to do it, and we're going to have the capacity to do it. But it's not that easy. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been made new. You have his Holy Spirit in you. But by the providence of God, there's, there's a residue from the old person that you once were. And that residue is called the flesh. That's what scripture calls it. It's this package of desires that we have and affections that we have that are really opposed to God. Now your flesh has the capacity to love. But your flesh only has the capacity to love one person. Guess who that is? You. And so if we're going to love one another, if our lives are going to be about self-giving and others benefiting, we have something 
to overcome. And thankfully, Jesus shows us how that is done. And so this morning, we're going to look at a couple different passages. We're going to look at one that shows us how Jesus equips us to love. And then we're going to look at another pack, uh, passage that shows us uh, how we practice that love, how we ultimately live that out. So we're going to begin uh, with Jesus' words to his disciples. And, and we're going to see that if we want to love like Jesus, we have to start by abiding in his love. The command that Jesus gave last week was, as I have loved you, you love one another. Jesus is our provision of love. Jesus is our inspiration for love. Jesus is our example of love. We, we looked at the passage where Jesus is washing his disciples' feet as an example of how to love one another. But we can read that story and, and, and we can see the words of Jesus. We can acknowledge all of that. But it's not enough. There, there's something else that has to happen if we're going to overcome our flesh. And what Jesus says ultimately is that you need to stay close. So we're going to be in John 15. This is the same conversation that, that Jesus is having with his disciples that we saw in John 13. This is kind of the second phase of that, the second part of that. And Jesus is going to talk to us about how we can have the capacity to love, starting in verse 4. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And then verse 12, reiterating the command that he gave in chapter 13, this is my commandment that you have love, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he gives a greater description of that. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Fruit is the product of a healthy tree that, that is full of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And fruit grows for the benefit of others, for someone to come by and pick it, and it benefits them, and it blesses them. And God desires, as followers of Jesus, that we bear fruit, particularly the fruit of love. Think about the fruits of the Spirit we find in Galatians 6. What's the first one? The first one is love. Now, abide's a word that we don't use very often. It might make you think of the word abode, which is home or dwelling. And the word that Jesus uses here, it's a Greek word that ultimately means to remain, to stay, to persist, to endure, just to keep going. And so what Jesus is saying is that abide in me. It's a long-term, consistent commitment to be in his presence and to be with him. And if abiding is what's needed for us to truly love one another, to live out this command, this makes us all, puts us all in a place where we have to answer or a question that we have to answer. Is Jesus going to be our spiritual home or is Jesus going to be our spiritual Airbnb? Right? Is Jesus going to be the headquarters of our life or is he going to be a place that we stop by from time to time and we check in and we check out no earlier than three and no later than noon and we just come by to visit every once in a while? See, our answer to that question uh, it will, will, will impact the amount of fruit that we bear in our lives and impact our ability to love one another. This past Christmas break, I had a, <clears throat> a rather surreal moment uh, as my oldest son, Christian, and I researched colleges for him. It was, it was quite a moment. Uh, we, we, we spent some time going online and talking about different schools and reaching out to them and asking for information. And it was very exciting, right, this idea of this new chapter in life. But it was also extremely sobering. Because in the middle of all that, I realized in about 18 months, he's gone. Now, he'll come home for Christmas break, and, and he'll come home for summer. But we only have about 18 months left where he is abiding in our home and abiding in the presence of Martha and me. And if he tries to move back ever, I'm going to tell him to get a job and go abide somewhere else, but that's a second conversation. <laughs> and you can imagine 
the sobering effect that this conversation had. You see, there's fruit that I want to see in Christian's life. And I realize that my time of influence is ticking away and ticking away and ticking away and ticking away. Now, thankfully, you and I don't graduate away from Jesus, but we can still choose to put distance between us and him. Most followers of Jesus I talk to who are struggling with their relationship with Jesus to to make it all that they might want to be or all they read about in Scripture, the challenge begins with the fact that they are not abiding. They may not know how. They they may lack a desire for it. And if you're here this morning, you say, Kurt, I want to love one another and, and I want to abide in Jesus. I want to give you some real practical ideas for that that really you could start this week if you, if you were here this morning and struggling. Most of you have a phone. Most of you have a Bible app on your phone. And all of those Bible apps have, have different uh, Bible reading plans. You can go choose one, and it'll give you a, a passage of Scripture that you can read every day. If you don't want to do that, maybe you just go to Scripture and pick a book like the book of Psalms, and you read a psalm a day, and you hear and read about the heart of God. If you're in a life group... Uh, right, we have sermon aligned curriculum in our life groups right now that has homework. Now, the homework isn't to be done 10 minutes before your next life group meeting. Mm-hmm. That's an opportunity for you to connect with God throughout the week and dig deep into His Word and to abide in Him. We have a training experience on spiritual disciplines. These spiritual disciplines are practices uh, that, we can, uh, that we can live out that get us near to God, that help us to abide. You'll get a lot of different ideas to do that. And all of the, if all of that is just too much, you say, I don't, even, I don't even want to start there. Start here. Start your day by praising God for three things that are true about him that you adore. Whether it's his holiness or his love or his grace or his mercy, And then end your day as you look back and thank him for three things that happened in your life that day. That's 30 seconds in the morning and that's 30 seconds in the evening. Maybe that is the place that you need to begin to abide. I give you all those because when we do that, any of those things, we move towards God. And our heart is that we want to abide in him. And I know with confidence that God will honor that and he will show up. Because he wants you to abide in him and he wants you to bear fruit and he wants you to love one another. And so if you've struggled with abiding, take that first step and let God meet you there. On the same passage, Jesus gives us another way to abide. If you look at verse 9, this is what Jesus says. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We're talking about obedience. Obedience. Such an ugly word when we speak it, right? It's, oh, obedience. Listen. Listen. Here's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying obedience isn't the drudgery of the Christian life. Obedience isn't the way that we earn God's love or that we, that we obey enough and we say, okay, God, now you've got to give us love. Mm-mm. Obedience is a response. It's a loving and faithful response to God's love that he's given us, and it's a loving and faithful response to honor the boundaries that God has placed in our relationship. So obedience is the pathway to intimacy with God. Obedience draws us closer to Jesus and allows us to experience his love. And as we experience his love, we can then turn around and give it to others. As I thought about that, it made me think of of a campfire. If you've ever been camping and you start a fire, man, they're beautiful things, right? But that campfire, your proximity to that campfire will determine the impact it has on your life. If you're far away from that fire, you barely be able to feel feel the heat and you are going to grow cold. But as you get closer, you're going to experience that heat more and more. And if you stand close enough, long enough, not only will you be, uh, feel the warmth of that, experience the warmth of the fire, you will become warm yourself. If you've ever stood by a campfire for a long time and you step away, your clothes are hot and your skin is hot. That means that you're not just experiencing it, you become a conduit of it. 
You have the ability now to turn around and give it to someone else. If you went and hugged someone when they were cold and you were hot because you were standing by the fire, you now become the source of heat for them. And it's the same thing with the love of Jesus. Our, our disobedience puts us further and further and further away from the warmth of his love. It doesn't cut us off from it. Nothing can, can make Jesus to stop loving us. But when we put that distance between us and Jesus, we prevent his love from working in our lives. And that begins to compromise our ability to love one another. In Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the signs of the end times. And he says something that's just astounding to me because it speaks directly to this relationship between obedience and love. Matthew 24, 12, he says this. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. It's because as disobedience increases, love decreases, and you can't give what you don't have. But obedience, obedience keeps us close to Jesus. It keeps us close to the warmth of his love. It doesn't earn it, it doesn't beckon it, it doesn't say, now you owe this to me. It lets us stay close to him and be changed by his love. And the more we abide in his love, the more we experience it for ourselves, and the more we can turn around and give it to somebody else, to give it to one another. We don't just experience the love of Jesus at that point. If we abide in it, we begin to radiate it ourselves, just like the heat from a fire. So if you are moved and you think, I want to love one another, I want to love someone today, start by obeying Jesus and see what he does. I think you'll be pleased with those results. So we abide in Jesus, and when we do that, we experience his love so that we can give it to one another. But how do we ultimately put that into practice? How does the love of Jesus affect our lives and ultimately manifest itself for us to love one another. This next passage we're going to look like says this, is that if we want to love like Jesus, we're going to need to lay down self and lead with love. If you've been to enough Christian weddings, you, you've probably heard this passage uh, that, we're, that we're going to look at. It's called the love chapter. But if you understand the context of it, you, you understand it has nothing to do with wedded bliss. See, it's 1 Corinthians 13. It's part of a letter that Paul wrote to the, the church in Corinth, and that church was messed up. They were divided all over the place. They were taking communion in ways that were dishonoring to God and dishonoring each other. They, they, had, they were prone to try to rank people and, based on what gifts that they had. And the place was a mess. Place was a total mess, and so Paul writes a letter to address this. In chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, he, he reminds them of what communion is about, and he, and he teaches them how to do that properly. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, maybe my favorite chapter in the New Testament, he talks about the unity that they have in the Holy Spirit, and that every single member of that church is necessary, is indispensable because of the gifts that they bring, and that God has placed them there to serve in that body. But at the end of chapter 12, Paul says, now, I've talked to you about all this, but here's, here's the real truth, guys. You, something is wrong because you are missing something in your fellowship in the church at Corinth. And so he ends chapter 12 by saying this. He says that I want to show you a still more excellent way. And that takes us to the beginning of chapter 13 where he says this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. 
It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's one of the most beautiful and moving passages of Scripture. It makes sense why it would show up at a wedding ceremony. And now you know why Paul said it, so you get to impress people the next wedding you go to. But it causes us, to, I think, to think, uh, think about something. And have you ever considered that the, the best part of you, the most impressive part of you, if offered with the wrong heart, could ultimately be worthless? See, our presence and our gifts and our wisdom and, and our experience and our counsel and our effort all have the capacity to bless one another. But if they're not offered in love, Paul says they're just self-serving noise that do nothing for the other person and that God rejects. Growing up, y'all remember this, uh, the little toy that a lot of people had? It was that monkey that had the terrifying grin on his face and he had two symbols and he'd turn them on and go, and he'd just start clanging the symbols. I see some nodding heads good. When I read that passage, that's what I thought of. If we don't move forward with love and, do, and exercise our gifts with love, we're like that toy. We're just a lot of self-serving noise and not doing anything for the benefit of another. Let me think about over the last few years in, in the American church, some of these, the most gifted pastors in all of the church falling out. The question wasn't around their gifts. Their question was around the fact that they weren't doing it with the love of Jesus. And ultimately, their efforts proved their downfall because they didn't include love. As Paul's telling us about love, he doesn't actually give a definition here, which I think is kind of interesting. Instead, he shows us what love does and what love doesn't do. He begins by connecting with two other fruits of the Spirit. He talks about patience, right? Love is passive, not in a, in a negative way, but in a, in a way that, that sits and waits for the other person. And then love is assertive or initiates with kindness. And Paul says that, that goes through this list of things that love isn't. And he says that, that love is ultimately incompatible with my own agenda, with my own acclaim, with my own sense of entitlement, that none of those things are connected to love. And I love verse 7. I, if you want a memory verse, I would encourage you to read verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And Paul says that love puts up with everything. Remember last week we talked about love uh, could sometimes uh, get messy. But love hangs in there and, and love keeps going with that even though it can be challenging sometimes. Paul says that love believes the best of the other person. Now, sometimes people don't give you any reason to believe uh, the best of them, but love looks to the God who is the best, the, the God who, who has made that person and saved that person, and we believe that he has the best in mind for them. And so we believe the best of him. Paul says that love wants the best for someone. They want the, the, the love of God to change their life so that they can live the life that God wants. There's this German word called schadenfreude. And that, it's a word that means to delight in the misfortune of another. It made me think about uh, just all the divisions that we have in our culture and in our nation and how you see the rejoicing when someone on the other side falls when they have a malady in their life, when they make a mistake, when they have some kind of misfortune or trial that comes into their life, that has no place in the church. I mean, love wants the absolute best for every person that it encounters. And then Paul says that love keeps going. It endures. That word that he uses for endure is connected to the word abide. Love remains, love stays, love is consistent. And love sends a message day after day, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Love rejoices when others thrive. This passage challenged me uh, over the last couple of weeks. I 
had a conversation with one of my other sons. I'm engaged with my boys. I'm intentional with them. I want the best for them. Sometimes I could be very enthusiastic about that. Probably a more truthful word is assertive. So I was talking to my, one of my other sons about my approach, and this is what he said. You know, Dad, sometimes I just wish you'd start by saying hello. Mm. See, that caused me to, to, to look at my own motivation. That when I get a little assertive, when I get a little demanding, what is the purpose of that? And, and the message was clear from my son. Dad, Dad, remind me that you love me, and then everything else that follows that I will receive in the context of that love. And so I believe that people will be infinitely more receptive to the exercise of our gifts when they've already experienced the expression of our love. And as we read about the one another's in Scripture, we get serious about living these things out. One another's cause us to move towards someone else. You can't one another by yourself. It is an action that we move towards someone else. And I think if, as we get serious about this, that this is an opportunity for us to say we need to go through a certain practice here. And every time I believe that I'm going to move forward towards someone to exercise, practice one of these one another's, I need to ask a question first. Is my motivation to do this thing that I'm about to do love? And if the answer is no, then to push pause and to examine yourself. Because if it's not about love, my guess is it's ultimately about you. So examine yourself on that and ask, is this loving? And if the answer is yes, go, because that's why God has put us in each other's lives. That's why God calls us to abide in his love so that we can turn around and love one another in the same way. I want to close this morning uh, with a story of loving one another that happened in our midst, in our church. And then I want to give us all some time to do business uh, with God. In addition to being MLK weekend, it's also Sanctity of Human Life Day today. And some of you know that this is a, a once a year where we really focus on the infinite worth of all life because the infinite God who created life puts his image on each and every one of us. And the focus is oftentimes on the preborn. That's something I think we need to talk more about as a church, but this morning I want to focus on this amazing act of love towards one of our own who was desperate to know and experience the love of Jesus. A woman in our congregation recently submitted her courageous next step, uh, and this is what she said. I shared with a small group of ladies at church that I had an abortion 25 years ago. I was shamed and fearful, but sharing with these women led to me receiving God's grace and forgiveness. Freedom from this shame and guilt and the desire to help other women do the same. This is why God has given us to one another. This group of women who had experienced the love of Jesus themselves poured out that love on this woman and broke 25 years of bondage. See, love one another is, isn't just be nice to one another. 
It's a call for all of us to be walking and breathing reminders of the love of God and to give that to people to help them live the life that God has for them. And the experience of this woman is an experience that I want to make sure everybody in our church has. You see, if there's anyone in our church who's, who's had the same story as she does and is suffering with shame and suffering with guilt, the most loving and safest place in the world for her should be the church. I read a statistic recently that said uh, for 70, over 70% of Christian women, if they had an unplanned pregnancy, would not go and talk to their pastor about it. And it broke my heart. So I want to commit to you this morning, if you are in that situation, I want to have that conversation with you. I'm going to tell you the truth, but it is going to be saturated in love. And if you're uncomfortable talking to me, I understand. I want you to know there's a bunch of awesome women on our staff, and they would be eager to have that conversation with you and to show you the love of Jesus Christ. And if that doesn't it makes you uncomfortable, I want you to know that we have resources that we can connect you to. I've asked Cheryl Reed to be out in our connecting center. And if you're in that situation or you know someone in that situation and you want a resource, she'd be happy to connect you with that. And if you want to serve other people in this situation, she has options for that too. And I want to say one more thing. If you are here this morning and you are burdened and shackled by shame and guilt because you are a woman with this in your past or you are a man with this in your past who made that happen, I want you to hear this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And he wants to offer you his grace and his mercy, and his forgiveness, and freedom from the guilt and shame that is piled up on you. It's time to stop suffering. Run to the cross because he is there. And he is willing, and he is able, and he is loving, and he has paid the price. And run to your brothers and sisters in Christ because they have received the love of Jesus and they want to pour that love out on you. You don't have to go through this alone. The love of God shines brightest in our darkest moments. And God has given us the awesome privilege to shine that light of love into each other's lives. What a privilege it is. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I was going to come out and just play some keys, and I, uh, I want to take a few minutes and abide in Jesus. And I want to prompt you with some things to pray about. I know you might have to get to lunch. I know the line at Jason's Deli is already stacking up. I know it's a three-day weekend and there are things that you want to get to. But would you take a breath and take a couple minutes to be in the presence of Jesus? And Lord, we pray that you would settle our hearts and help us to focus on you right now. <clears throat> Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Would you take a minute to rejoice in that good news? 
And would you worship the God of love for laying down his life for you? If you came in here this morning believing that there is something in your life that is beyond the reach of God's love, would you tell him that right now and would you listen? Because he's going to tell you that that is simply not true. Nothing is beyond his love. So receive it this morning. Jesus said, abide in my love. That's the only way you're going to love one another like I have loved you. Would you ask God to give you a real sense of how you are abiding? If there's one thing that you could do this week to abide more, whether it's a discipline or maybe obeying where you currently aren't, God has placed people in your life to love them like he has loved you. Would you ask him who that is and would you ask him for the courage to do so this week? Father, we praise you that you are the God who is love. We praise you that you've poured that love out on us, that you went first. We praise you that the greatest expression of love is when one lays down their life for another, and we know, Lord, you sent your son to do that very thing for us. That while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us because of love. Lord, we want to be people of love. We want to be a church of love. We want visitors and guests to walk in these doors and say there's something about this church that is loving. And we want to live that out with one another and we want to take that love 
to wherever you might have us. And I pray, Lord, that you draw us to yourself, help us to abide so that you can grow the fruit of love in our lives. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In the great name of Jesus, amen. Go love somebody this week. See you next Sunday.